Hey, welcome everyone to the Archicad User Monthly Training Webinar. Today is October 17th, 2019, and I'm Eric Bobro, as I imagine you know, talking to you from a sort of early fall day here in San Rafael, California. Let me know that you can hear me and see my screen, and we'll get going and tell me where you're calling in from. Now, you can type in on the GoToWebinar chat area, and you can also use Slack. If you're a member of my training programs, then you can use the coaching calls channel in Slack. And just uh, say where you're calling in from and uh, just confirm that you can hear me and see me. All right, so Greg from Vero Beach, Glenn from Auckland, all right, Scott, Minneapolis, Janelle also from Auckland. You know each other, Glenn Macbeth and Janelle Mamog. Um, all right, Christina, Chris Joel, oh, from Alberta, Dave from Germany, Nicholas from Ukraine. Okay, we've been hearing a lot about Ukraine here in the US. Perhaps you're familiar with some of the political stuff that has been happening. And AD, all right, Sherwood Park, Alberta, Garrett from Doylestown, Pennsylvania, all right, Joel from across the bay in Concord, okay, and uh, I'm seeing in the Slack workspace, uh, Bob and Tom, Greg, and uh, okay, so uh, we shall get going, Is Slack go, all right, so what are we doing today, so um, as you know, I've been working with Arcad a very long time, over 30 years now. Uh, gotten been through a lot of upgrades. So upgrading from one version of Archicad to another, there are some things that I think are useful to know about. Uh, I imagine many of you have been through quite a few upgrades yourself. Some of you are pretty new, and uh, this may be uh, sort of a new thing for you. <clears throat> so when you are Moving from one version of Archicad to another, you're going to be dealing with a few things just as general categories. You're going to be dealing with learning a new interface. Sometimes it's there's big changes, like from 19 to 20. Um, sometimes there's new technologies that are really changed fundamentals about the way you work, like going from 16 to 17 when we had uh, building materials introduced and the priority intersections, uh, creating sections. Uh, on a more detailed uh, level. Um, sometimes it's just simply uh, a matter of getting used to a few things and migrating some settings and libraries and things like that. And I think that's really what we have in 23 is a relatively simple, straightforward transition because the interface hasn't changed significantly. Uh, of course, there are some new features. Uh, there's a there are new options for the column and beam tools that allow you to do more complex uh, columns and beams and make them connect to each other uh, more cleanly and more easily. Um, you know, there's a new opening tool, which I haven't played around with much, but if you're doing complex buildings with multiple structures relating to each other, um, you know, a, a, let's say a, a structural frame and, and uh, a cladding that are somewhat independent. You want to be able to cut through um, all of them in a, with a single uh, sort of management interface, then the whole tool will allow you to do that. Um, there are some just interface enhancements where you say, oh, this dialog box, box looks a little different. There are some tweaks in terms of like uh, labels the ability to now have the pointer for your label point to the first line or the last line nicely, cleanly, directly to the side of the text, whereas before it would go to the center of the whole thing or top or bottom above or below the text, which was a little frustrating for many of us. So some changes like that. Now there are some subtle things, of course, behind the scenes, Graphisoft uh, as talked about, and, and I'll bring up the um, uh, the Graphisoft website so we can just sort of see. Uh, if, if you want information about Archicad, of course, you go to the developer's website. 
uh, Graphisoft. I'm just going to expand it a little bit here. So um, you can see a whole presentation on Archicad 23, and you can, you know, there's a variety of resources. But if you just click on Archicad, it's going to talk about, of course, Archicad 23. And in this case, it's going to focus on what's new here. So here's the re-engineered column and beam tools. Um, interesting, you know, design here for a library in San Diego. <clears throat> um, and this column having some multiple components there, um, the beam here being able to connect sort of these subtle little transitions here can be part of it and the beam, you know, actually potentially connecting to, um, you know, the end uh, here cleanly. Uh, the voids and holes, etc. as I mentioned, uh, these are things that will be useful for certain projects. Um, the twin motion connection is certainly a, a really sweet looking thing. I haven't spent much time with it, but it does seem pretty simple to get your model into twin motion and to get some, you know, pr much improved visualization um, with very little effort and uh, gives you a lot of options there. Um, other things that uh, we won't be talking about today, but I'll just mention, you know, there is an ongoing effort to connect Archicad up to other programs through IFC, which is a general interchange format uh, that's used by, you know, let's say generally all building information modeling tools whether they're design tools or analysis tools. Um, so here we have Solibri, um, which uh, is a use for coordination and checking of the integrity of the model. DeRofus, I don't quite know, it's having to do with planning rules. So basically you can say, does it meet code or meet certain programming uh, you know, ideals or restrictions? And Rhino, which is the interface uh, for um, the uh, grasshopper or <clears throat> the grasshopper interface for Rhino um, to be able to connect up our kids to a much more uh, freeform modeling tool. So we won't be spending time talking about those. Uh, and I won't really be talking about the faster response times. I am interested in knowing whether you've experienced that. For example, when you've taken a project forward, have you found that our kid 23 is noticeably faster, Graphisoft? is saying that they worked hard on the parts that you wait for and that these things have been improved so that in general you can get your project done faster. So one thing I'd like to see is can you type in to the chat area or into Slack whether you've started to use 23 and what your general impression is. Is it faster? Do you like certain specific things? Is there anything that's annoying or causing you challenges or questions. Um, so please type that in. And I might actually open up the line to one or two people here or there to discuss some of these things. So I'm just doing a quick survey visually here uh, to talk about what's in 23, just from a very high level. And then I'll be showing you how to migrate a project, how to migrate a template, and the things that you need to pay attention to if you want to get the most out of 23 and make the transition as smooth as possible. Uh, so when we look at these productivity enhancements, uh, some of them are very subtle, like the input dialogues are simplified, um, <clears throat> et cetera. Uh, interesting, the sunlight settings provide live feedback about the cast and self shadows. I haven't actually uh, paid attention to that, but I'm going to look at that today if I can. Uh, I have looked at the Cinner Render engine, but more so the built-in surface catalog, which actually is remarkably better. So in other words, when you make something out of uh, brick or stone or concrete or something uh, and look at it, it looks much more natural, naturalistic or realistic uh, right in the 3D window. Um, and in order to take advantage of that for a migrated project, there's some things that you'll need to be aware of. Um, there's some other things um, when you have surface missing surfaces, it's a little bit easier to manage them 
uh, because of some of the um, uh, options that they have for showing you that you're missing some textures. Um, and there's some annoyances that have been taken away that you may not notice, but future generations of ARCHICAD users will just take for granted the fact that you can rename a model view option and it won't make all your views that refer to that model view option all of a sudden have a missing link, um, things like that. Um, so what I'd like to do now, is let me just take a quick scan of um, the comments. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, Tom Downer says not used yet for 23. Greg says, I own a full version of Twin Motion. Do you know if I need to download the free version in order to move more smoothly transition the workflow with Unreal Engine now incorporated or do I just do it the same as I have been? That's a very good question and I don't have an answer for you. I check with Graphisoft because all I've been using and only a limited amount is the free version. Um, so, uh, do check with them and let me know what you find out. Um, so let me go to the chat area. Um, okay. So there are a couple of people who say no sound, but clearly we've been getting response from people. So I imagine they have, uh, it was a local issue. All right. So Mark Bly says Archicad 23 is greater than why and greater than faster. So I guess you're saying that it is faster on, um, and uh, Janelle says, waiting for the bug fix for Catalina on Mac OS, uh, on the Mac OS. So uh, for those of you who are on the Mac, upgrading to the new operating system, Catalina, is something you should wait. If you have, have a choice, if you're not just buying a new machine right now, because there are some issues with ARCHICAD, and there are definitely issues with um, a lot of legacy software. So uh, they took out, uh, Apple took out support for 32-bit applications. So these are older applications that were, you know, created, you know, let's say in previous years, may, maybe, you know, more than five years ago um, in general. And uh, they uh, basically will no longer run. And so, you know, if you upgrade to Catalina, while some things will, I'm sure, be better, you may have some software that you're used to using, like older versions of Microsoft Office, or I use an uh, audio editing program called Audacity, which is a free download from the internet. And it has a message saying it's not gonna work in future updates of the operating system. So I'm waiting there, but for our ARCHICAD, Graphisoft does have a warning saying they will be supporting it, but there are some issues. Um, okay. Uh, Steve Pribble says, I haven't noticed any speed increases, but I'm reading the file across a LAN, so not optimum. All right, so one thing about when you're reading a, an ARCHICAD file across a network, that would affect your reading speed, but not your operation speed. So in other words, it would be slower to read that, you know, 100 megabytes or 500 megabyte file but once it's read in, it's inside your computer. So um, I wouldn't expect working with a LAN um, would be an issue. Um, now, Richard Matthews says, so far, Arcad 23 has issued a bit of grief, very slow or even hanging up, moving simple elements such as a line may have a fix, but time is not easy to find to continue to experiment. Okay, so that's a little bit disappointing. Um, I personally have had slowdowns on my Mac when just in general, since I upgraded to Mojave, which is the version just before Catalina, I did that in maybe July. And here and there, I will have hangups where the computer just hangs for 60 seconds or more. And then it comes back as if nothing's happened. Um, seems to be having issues managing memory. And yet I have a 16 gigabyte, two year old MacBook Pro. Um, so pretty good machine. Um, and, uh, but, that has nothing to do with ARCHICAD. At first I thought it might, but I've had it just doing email and web browsing. So these computers, these tech technology is challenging. All right, so Brett says, uh, downloaded but yet to test. It'll be a weekend task. Tom Palmer says, um, haven't worked a lot in 23 yet, but seems to be quicker in general. All right, Ken Brooks says, how can I get on Slack? I'm not on the list of allowables, it seems. All right, so Ken, um, send me an email to support at bobro.com and I'll give you 
uh, the link. Um, so uh, Rich Matthews, his library items have also have disappeared, not an easy transfer. So we will be um, uh, looking at the library management here. Um, so what channel in Slack for Rick Skorik? I'm uh, doing it on the coaching calls channel today. Um, okay, and Brenton says, have just done it in the last few days. So far, none of the shutdown bugs I have had have gone, but excited to hear my take on it. Um, bug fix for Catalina, Catalina is coming, but no issues I've seen found yet. Okay, Francois from South Africa. I'm on my phone, no problem with audio. Okay, um, all right. So more issues with other software, Brenton says, not really any issues with 23. Um, so, okay, um, and I'm looking at some final comments before we move on, and I'm gonna close my uh, door here because there's some stuff going on outside. Okay, so, um, okay, so Eric Gedney, I'm waiting on listening to these kinds of seminars before transitioning to 23. Okay, so um, I'll do my best to give you the confidence to move forward. Uh, Andy says, working on a PC, and it has had a couple of fits, freezing up, but on the whole, good and a bit faster. And Bob says, that's why I haven't upgraded since Mojave locked up my computer and I lost all of my old files. Yeah, you know, it's risky having a computer, right, uh, and keeping it upgraded or not upgraded. All right, well, let's let's go on to our CAD 23. So let me... Um, bring up 23 here. All right, so this is the US version. US version, they, the last couple of years have had a worksheet with a nice, beautiful um, splash screen. You know, this is the uh, feature project for 23, which uh, I think is a rhythmic gymnastics competition space. So rhythmic gymnastics, if you don't know, I don't know much about it, but I guess they uh, do acrobatic things and they have uh, ribbons and things that float through the air. And so this is obviously like a ribbon floating in the air. And this was done in Arcad 23, I think with Grasshopper. So it's using uh, th this organic shape here was done with, um, you know, this outside tool, but easily coordinated back and forth with Archicad. And I, I gather the structural model as well was coordinated there. So, um, it was all done fully digitally, fully coordinated, fully BIM, um, and Graphisoft is rightfully proud of it. Um, okay, so uh, here we have 23 in the US version, and I'm using the standard work environment profile. If you don't know what I mean, if you go to the options menu, work environment, there are profiles when you first install 23, Unless you import an old profile, you will have the standard profile. And these various profiles potentially change the way the palettes look, even potentially can modify the menus so that when you're doing layouts, or if you have someone in your office doing just organizing layouts, they might have a simplified set of menus compared to the one where you're designing. And visualization might have some more shortcuts or toolbars that relate to rendering and 3D visualization here. So I'm using the standard one here. I'm gonna also switch over to the international version here. And this is the standard one for the international. And what's interesting is that they don't even show the navigator in the international one by default. Now the pop-up navigator here allows you to very quickly get access to all of the different parts of the navigator system, but as soon as you click outside it, it disappears. If you do want it to be retained or visible, then, uh, you know, on the side of your screen, then you can press down on this little project chooser button and say, hey, I'd like to show the navigator, um, and it will then appear. Uh, we still have the pop-up navigator here, um, and we can also switch between the navigator and the organizer, which will be um, either floating in space or you can dock it to the side here. But since it's really repetitive, then I would want to say hide the navigator and we end up with this double wide area. So those changes that I'm just, or that 
last couple of minutes of explanation are things that were new in, <clears throat> I think, version 20. So uh, that's not new in 23. But it was interesting to see that the international version, they have gone with the mini navigator um, and no visible navigator when someone just installs Archicad. Now, the menus are basically the same as they've been. If you're in the international version under the options menu, element attributes is a submenu, whereas in the US version under the options menu, all the element attributes are directly below. So there are differences between the US and international, and today's I'm not gonna be focusing very much on them, but here and there I'll point them out. Uh, one small difference just in conventions is that international uh, usage is that the ground floor is story zero, and the first floor, which is the next one up, is story one, whereas in the US we start with the first floor being the ground floor, and then the second floor being one flight up. Um, and that you'll see that in the numbering here, as opposed to, it would be zero, one, two, three for the international. Now, so far, I'm just talking about the general environment and pointing out a couple of things. The, uh, the US template changed a bit so that it's now got um, these preset uh, section markers and elevation markers that are visible right when you start. If you draw your building in this general area, then you can leave them sort of in that original position. Of course, if the building is larger or smaller and it, the sections should be in different positions, you'll want to move them and add more sections. That goes almost without saying. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the subtle things that are in the new environment that you just need to know about. Now, I'm not going to be giving you a full training on the new features of 23, but I will quickly go over the ones that seem to be most interesting. Now, let me just draw a little box here, and we'll go to 3D, and we're now looking at the little box here. Okay, now as I roll the mouse wheel, so I'm rolling my magic mouse, because I have a Mac, and this is the mouse here that is um, has no buttons on it, um, and it's able to be sensitive to my fingers on which side, etc. But as I roll this, you notice it's things are moving up and down. I'm not zooming in and out. And that is a little bit puzzling if you're migrating um, to this. If I press down, I think it's the shift key. Now I'm um, I'm actually orbiting one way or another with it with that uh, the magic mouse. And if I press down the option key, then I'm zooming in and out. Now I find it annoying to have to use the option key to be able to zoom in and out. So I usually will go in to the work environment to input constraints and guides, which has a little picture of a mouse because normally you're inputting with the mouse um, here. And I change the default that Graphisoft installs for the magic mouse to say when I scroll, I'd like to zoom. So then it returns to just the same way that it's been for, you know, for decade for a decade or more, where you roll the mouse wheel and then it zooms in and out. So that's a, a little important note to avoid frustration there. Um, now I think uh, other things that um, you may want to look at here. Uh, let's see more options here. There's an interesting linked tabs feature that was introduced. I think last year or possibly the year before, which will allow you to change the settings of one tab, like the 3D window, and have it change the settings of um, another tab, like the floor plan. So if you turn on and off different layers, uh, these things can be linked uh, if you uh, use that. Um, now, let's just see here. Uh, okay, so uh, now I can zoom in, and now I should be able to Oh, did I cancel? Uh, I may have done that. Um, so input constraints here and zoom and say OK. And now I can zoom in and out with my mouse without any other hand. Um, OK, so one of the interesting things is that if I select all these walls and I make them a surface, uh, let's say, uh, let's just make them a simple wall type. Um, and say that I'd like it to be 
um, you know, masonry structural type of brick, um, actually masonry uh, non-structural brick here. Um, now, if I zoom in on this, what you'll see is that the texture appearance is much more realistic, beautifully done um, than it ever was before. Now, the reason why or well, let's say the mechanics of how this was done is under the options menu, the surfaces for all the Graphisoft supplied surfaces have been redefined to use higher resolution images. So if I look at something like um, the bricks here, you can see this image here, 1024 by 1024, the older images tended to be like 250 pixels across. So much, much more resolution. Um, now it's interesting, this is the um, uh, shape here. You notice that this is 1024 by 1024 in pixels. So it's a square image and it is being set up to be uh, narrower and taller. So that particular image is being distorted, but it does look pretty natural here. And of course, natural there. If I say keep original proportion, you can see it looks a little bit odd um, in, in that sense that these bricks get elongated and we now have a square image. Um, now I'll just go to another one of these, let's say the um, herringbone. Um, you, know, you can just see that it's got just a whole lot more definition. If we go to uh, things like uh, concrete precast, uh, it just has a much more natural look and you know, much more, many more pixels, more resolution here. Now I'll cancel this. Now the reason why I put this, point this out is not only to just say, hey, good work, Graphisoft, um, but if you bring a project forward from an earlier version, you're not gonna get this benefit unless you do a, a step of importing Graphisoft's textures or surfaces into your model. So we'll be looking at that in just a little while. So if you want to get, you know, textures and surfaces that are more realistic, taking advantage of 23, you'll need to do that. Um, now let's look at migrating a project. So I'm going to go to the file menu. I'll say open. And in this case, I'm going to open from master template. So um, many of you are familiar with Master Template. Many of you who are on the call uh, use it. Uh, it's a template that I developed along with an architect named Scott Bulmer back in 2007 and I've upgraded it every year. Um, it's a very robust tool for starting and running projects efficiently. Um, and as part of it, we have created a sample project which is just not supposed to be fancy architecture, but just to show how everything works together in this template. Uh, so I'm gonna use this as the migration example. So I'm gonna open up the sample project here. I'll launch a new instance so that I can keep this standard environment um, of ArchiCAD 23 open, and I'll tell it to open this. So it's gonna take a little while to run through the process, but let me just talk a little bit about um, the, let's see what do I have here, um, okay. Uh, so as, as it's opening it, I'll just talk about what uh, it needs to do. So of course it needs to launch the software and it's gonna read the file. When it reads the file, it'll recognize that it's an earlier version, so, um, it was made in an earlier version. It will then give me the opportunity to migrate the libraries for the project or to use the libraries that were in place before. So, you know, Graphisoft provides libraries every year with ARCHICAD, they change subtly. Some things, you know, uh, sometimes they'll redo all of the windows or they'll put in some new mechanical objects or uh, other things. Um, but in general, it's similar from year to year. Um, and it is a very extensive library and let's say in general, pretty useful um, and smart. Um, now, if you say don't migrate the library, what it'll do is it'll load up all the old library parts from 22 or whatever version you've got and any supplemental libraries that maybe you have your own personal library that you've downloaded, etc. So it'll load that. 
And the project should look pretty much the way it did when you were working on it in 22 or the earlier version. But you won't have access to the new, any new library parts, uh, any new changes that they've got because you're using the old libraries. So a very common thing to do, and generally a good idea, is to migrate the libraries. Let me just see, is this still um, opening? Yeah, it is. Um, oh, it actually was waiting for me to respond to this question, so I'm glad I double-checked. So here it's asking this. So I could skip this. It would use the old libraries, probably work okay. Um, then just use ARCHICAD, and aside from subtle changes in library dialogues uh, or dialogues for tools and things, you could just use ARCHICAD 23. Maybe it runs faster even. But I'm going to migrate the libraries so that I have access to the new library setup and have full compatibility with the things that were added to 23. What it will not migrate is the um, surface textures, and there are other things as well that'll be sort of using the old standards. But the surface textures are a key thing that I think is just a really nice improvement. So I'm going to show you how to gain the advantage of it. So when you're loading the project with a, uh, and migrating the libraries, it will load the new library plus a support folder called ARCHICAD Migration Libraries. Um, and if you have a really old project going back to 10 or 11 or 12, then there's a secondary um, set of libraries that you can load as well. And if you had an ancient project going back to ARCHICAD 5 or, or 7, then you'd go through some more elaborate things. But we're going to talk about routine ones from like ARCHICAD 22 or ARCHICAD 20 or 15, uh, things within the last few years. So when it loads this, it's going to load the new library plus the support migration library. Um, and in general, we should see only some minor warnings in the library manager. It'll basically tell us that there are some things to know about, but you probably won't have anything missing. So here we have this project. We open up. The last thing I had open was a section. Um, and in a moment, it will give us, um, actually, it's now ready to go here. OK, it's ready to go. If I go to the library manager um, here, we can see that it's loaded some things that were embedded in the project. It's loaded the new library, and it's loaded the migration libraries, which are located within the ARCHICAD 23 folder in a separate folder called ARCHICAD migration libraries. Now, you see down here there's these warnings. Now, an interesting thing is that it didn't bring up those warnings when I brought up, opened up the project, it just continued in saying, well, you know, you can always find out about this later. Here under warnings, you'll see there's some duplicated library parts because some of the things in the migration library duplicate things that I had embedded. We can see um, this list will take a moment to, to bring up and we'll see some substituted objects that means that it found a, uh, perhaps a later version of an object, and it thinks that they're the same, but it just wants to make a note about it. So these duplicated parts, there's UI is the beginning of a bunch of them. That's user interface. They have to do with the way that certain dialog boxes have little icons. Um, so these are just duplicates there. Um, there's pine, sea stone for culture stone, blue carpet. These are duplicates of certain textures. All right, so right now we have some warnings here, but it didn't really bother to tell me that there was any problem. And in fact, there isn't really a problem per se. Um, if I go to the plan um, here, we should see the project um, cleanly rendered uh, here. So right now I'm looking at a site plan, I think. If I go to the floor plan here, we can see you know, just a very clean, simple uh, design. Now, there is this new button here called Action Center, or new, um, what do you call it, uh, area that shows up as a tab. So when I click on that, you'll see some information about the project, a little warning about the libraries, 
some messages about hot links and drawings. So this is something that instead of getting a whole series of warning messages that you have to figure out what to do with and you may have a hard time remembering what was it that it was telling me, now you can say, all right, let me look at the libraries and it says there are some missing library parts that have been substituted. Open the library manager to review the items. So I could click here and go back to where I was a minute ago, or I can say show summary, and that'll take me back to the overview where it says there's action required on the libraries, hot links need checking, drawings need checking. All right, so if you've used ARCHiCAD for any period of time, you'll always get drawings need checking when you open up a file because except aside from very rare times when you made some changes, updated all the drawings on all the sheets, printed them out and closed the file. In that case, nothing's changed when you open it, but otherwise you've done some work and you haven't gone and looked at every single drawing on every single sheet. So this, this is always something that you can ignore. If I click here, it said they should be checked to detect if they've been modified and to ensure their sources are still available and you can go to the drawing manager to do it. So these are guides and they replace the warnings that came up when you opened a file. Um, now, one thing I'll point out about the hot links, if I go to the hot link manager, is that the hot links were from version 22. So these, uh, in master template, we have some supporting files that are linked in that provide some conveniences. Uh, and in previous versions of ARCHiCAD, I believe you could not update them if they were not in the current version. But now if I go here and I say, uh, uh, let's see, how do we do this? Um, refresh status. So this little pop-up allows me to check and says these are all okay. So in earlier versions of ARCHiCAD, it would say, you know, basically that it was uh, needed to be updated or there would be a message saying that it couldn't be updated because it was um, in a earlier version. Now it's saying, hmm, well, they haven't changed on the disk from where, um, where they were. So this is a little bit smoother there. Um, now let me just say, uh, cancel this here. So let's look at this in 3D. Oh, and let's actually, let's go to this little tab overview. So the tab overview, is brand new, very nice. It allows you to see, here's our plan that we were looking at. Um, let's go to our 3D view here. Um, it's gonna bring up this particular view inside um, the building. Um, and let's bring up the section here. And let's go back now to the tab overview. And we can see now these little previews and you can hover over them and you can see they highlight and if you open up more things, like for example, if I open up the uh, uh, title title sheet or something like that um, here, of course we get more um, tabs open. And then if I go back to the tab overview, we'll see there's the sheet. So it will keep on tiling these and give you a quick access to the different parts of your project. I think this is a very nice improvement. And the Action Center is also certainly uh, a nice little tweak uh, there. Now let's look at the 3D and I'll take a 3D view and we'll talk about just the textures and surfaces that I've been mentioning a few times. I'm going to widen this out here and we'll go to, uh, let's see, I have my sections of 3D views. We'll just take uh, an AXO overall. Okay, so this is the way it looks right now in terms of the uh, surface textures, uh, you know, it's not bad looking, it's not great, uh, but let's just draw a wall um, or actually let's just take, um, let's see if I take a wall here. I've done this before. Let's see if I go to the um, various overrides, let me take the outside, uh, let's see the outside here, instead of generic exterior, uh, let me go and make it a, a brick, you know, like this. Um, here, oh, actually, that's the edges. Um, no, this, uh, okay, that's the edges. Sorry about that. This is a complex profile, so we can't actually 
uh, make a change there. I'd have to do it in the definition of the complex profile. Um, let us see if I can take, now these are complex profiles as well. I don't know if I have any ones. Let's just draw a new wall um, off to the side here. So, and let's say that it's gonna be a basic wall and it's gonna be made out of masonry, not in structural, so it's gonna be a brick and it's gonna be 10 feet high um, and let's just say one foot thick just to be nominal uh, something and we'll do just a single one and let's just take a look at what this looks like. All right, so look at this. This is nowhere near as nice um, as we had here. You can see the subtlety that we have here and this one just fuzzier, not nearly as natural, much more repetitive. Uh, let me um, go and uh, override this with um, the outside. We'll make it a different brick, uh, you know, like a Flemish bond here. And you can see it just doesn't feel nearly as natural as this. And let's go around to, you know, the other side, maybe, maybe it'll be brighter on the other side here. No. Okay. So anyway, this is, you, you can see the difference. So how would we get that into um, a, an existing project? Well, you can use the attribute manager. So it's under the options menu, attribute manager. And attribute manager, by the way, is available directly underneath the options menu on the US version or under element attributes submenu off to the side in the international version. Now, when you're in attribute manager, you're looking at an overview of layers, pens, line types, fills, a bunch of different things. Now, one of them is surfaces. And you can see something like masonry non-structural, and it says that it's using a particular brick um, texture uh, here. Now, I can go and open up in a separate area from another file and bring in information from that other file. So for example, I can go to our CAD 23 folder and I can go to the defaults and find the ARCHID 23 template. So this is what's used by ARCHICAD when you say, give me a new file. Oh, just use the standard ARCHID 23 template. So this is the US version, of course. So I'll just say, open that. And it'll take a moment to load in. And it does give me a little message. There is an interesting, subtle thing about building materials that I'll talk about a little bit more later, but it's saying that if, if you bring in building materials from another file, and you don't have classifications that are defined in this file, those, when you bring in the building materials, they would like to bring in the classifications, but it will not add them to your file. So um, we'll be talking a little bit about classifications and properties um, today. But uh, so I'll, we'll pass over this and we'll look here. All right, so masonry is non-structural here. We look at the pop-up menu, brick, age, dark, dash OPT. Um, this one here is brick aged to OPT GS. So while they have similar names, they're clearly not the same. Um, so I can take this, this one um, here and I can say that I'd like to overwrite it by the index name. So what that'll do is it will actually um, bring in this masonry non-structural um, into here. We can see that the changes are that it's bringing in masonry non-structural and a hatch pattern. That would be the line work that you'd see possibly in an elevation. And I'll just say, okay, uh, do I want to apply the changes? Yes, I do. Now that means that anything that's using that particular surface will now look different. So let's go and select this and override the, the surface to be the um, masonry where is it? Masonry non-structural. And now we have that really nicely delineated surface. 
now that I've brought it in one at a time, we can bring in a whole batch of them. So I can go under the attribute manager again and uh, go to the surfaces and open up the template again. It'll have the same warning message. Now, the Graphisoft surfaces go from one to, let's see, these are, I'm sorry, this is um, this is my master template migrated project. The Graphisoft surfaces go up to about 150. And then in master template, we have some new ones that are added in later on. And I carefully separated them out to give space so that we wouldn't overwrite things. Um, because what we're gonna do now is look and say, this goes up to 159. So you can see 151 is zone room name. So these are some surfaces that you could use for certain types of zones. Apparently this one that sort of stray one that came in when I brought in an object in this file, but in general, I didn't have anything from 151 above. So all of these can be dropped in to the file. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna literally just click on any one of them, then do Command A or Control A to select all of these. And then I can overwrite them by index. Index means they'll keep the same number here. Now we have to be a little careful, and I don't. this isn't gonna be a complete training on everything you need to know, but uh, I'm gonna say don't include the associated attributes. What that'll mean is it's not gonna bring in a whole bunch of, um, well, actually, no, we'll, we'll do this. We'll bring it in. So what, what are associated with surfaces? Uh, the surfaces refer to the textures, which we, you know, I mentioned that was a different file. And they also refer to hatch patterns so that in an elevation, you potentially would show the brickwork or the boards, et cetera. So I'll say bring these in and bring them in by index. So now it has brought in, you can see these additional ones that were brought in. Then it goes up to the ones that were in master template. So there are ones that are sort of duplicated in terms of um, uh, in master template. I had filled in some things that weren't in the standard 22 template that were similar. So this would require a little bit more, let's say tweaking to reduce the duplicates, things like these additional ones that have been brought in and it says, oh, I'll give it a, a little change of name. But the bottom line is, if I wasn't explaining all of this, in one minute I could open up the template file, grab all of these updated surfaces, overwrite them here and say, okay. And we'll say apply and close. And we're gonna see in a moment after it finishes digesting it, ah, well, what happened? So the grass that I had, a surface on looks rather different. Now, I'm not sure I like that. We can select the mesh and say um, that the, well, it's made out of earth, the top surface. Maybe I don't want this grass, uh, but there is a grass 3D here. And, uh, you know, that's not so bad um, here. That's a little bit more natural looking. You can see what that looks like. Um, you know, I might play around with um, this grass, there's another grass one that they have, grass green here. Um, actually, that one is probably an old one um, from the previous one. We'll do grass 3D. Uh, now, the other thing that you can do in the new version is you can go to the surfaces here. And instead of the attribute manager, you can go and uh, create new surfaces. Now this has been around for since version 18, the ability to say, I'd like to create a new surface here. That's either a copy of the existing one that you then tweak. Let's just do this grass 3D copy and say this new one, I'd like to browse for a surface. So if we look here, you can see here's one. Let's look at something else, grass elephant, grass green, um, grass snowy, oh, interesting, snow on the grass, grass brown, sort of dead. Well, let's look at the elephant one. That actually looks pretty nice here, so we'll say okay. Um, and we can see how this 
preview changes. So this is, I haven't bothered naming it in a permanent way. We'll just say, okay. Now I didn't change this um, mesh, but now I can go in and say, I'd like to make it using the new 3D copy. And you know, that's actually, I think, suits my needs well. So that's one way that you can do that. And we're using the higher resolution images that Graphisoft provides in the library. And I'll show you one other way, which is that you can, instead of, uh, and let's just rename this grass uh, 3D, they call it elephant, I don't know why, but maybe that's the variety of grass there. All right, well, let's create a new one. And instead of um, duplicating and changing the texture manually, let's create a new one from a catalog. So what is a catalog? If you haven't used this before, you should definitely pay attention to this because the catalog of surfaces has been dramatically improved in ARCHIA 23. And it allows you to go search, for example, let's go to landscape here and let's do grass. All right, so now these are grass ones. They are similar, but what's gonna happen here is grass 3D tall. Let's try that one. Um, so I'll say, bring this one in. Okay, now the reason why this is superior is in addition to picking the surface texture that I just um, uh, manually picked, it's also gonna bring in the center render information. Um, so here, here is this is, and I'll say, okay. Um, and then having created it from that, I'll go in and change the top to grass 3D tall 23. Um, and we'll see it it looks pretty natural in, in one way but if we do a um, uh, what do you call it uh, a center render version of this it's going to have all the features that center render uh, gives us so it it will give us the benefit of you know some nicer looking texture um, here but also in center render it's going to render uh, better so the key thing to know is that because the surfaces are added into the ARCHICAD library, so if we go to the library manager, so in the ARCHICAD library 23, we have an improved catalog of surfaces, and that includes texture maps that you can just manually pick out, but you also have this catalog where you can pick out um, a uh, surface um, from from, uh, and that is coordinated between the OpenGL 3D window and the um, center render rendering. But in order to take advantage of it, you need, uh, in order to take full advantage of it um, for lots and lots of surfaces that have already been optimized, you need to use that attribute manager to bring it in. Now, if we're in the um, uh, international version, it's gonna be similar. Uh, the international version, if we go to the options, element attributes, attribute manager, so it's in the side menu, and we're gonna be also looking at surfaces. Now this is a, a native file 23, so it's not gonna have any differences, but if we go to, um, if we wanted to import it into a migrated file, then again, we would go get, in this case, in my 23 international folder, because I have, you know, both US and international on my machine, so I have to have a different folder name. I'm gonna go in here and I'll pick the Arcad 23 template here, and we'll just take a quick look at this. There are 132, so there are fewer surfaces there. So the international version has differences to the uh, American version, but again, all of the these um, surfaces have been reworked and you'd want to select all of them and bring them in to your file. Now, I've been talking so far about just, hey, bringing in a project that you have underway. And the other area that, of course, you need to think about or know, have a good idea of how to approach is working with your template. Uh, so let me just see if there are any comments or questions on what I did so far. Um, Okay, so Eric Gedney says, if we have our own names for the materials, then we would have to upgrade or override individually, right? Okay, so um, 
there is an option in that attribute manager. If you select something like this wood one here, you can overwrite by index, meaning that whatever is in that index position, 124, would be overwritten and updated. Or you can append, in which case it'll go at the end. It'll just add itself to the end. So you can bring in all of these and append them, and they will show up later in the list, or bring in any that you want. Um, so that's one way to avoid an issue. Now, uh, so if you went into the Graphisoft standard um, surfaces, for example, and renamed them to suit your purposes, um, then you'll want to carefully manage that process. Now, I could actually bring it in by index number to overwrite it and then rename it so I can get it back to that name. You, you know, you can go select the name here. And uh, I guess you can copy it using the keyboard, you know, Command C or Control C. Um, then you could bring something in and then rename it. So you could do that one at a time. Uh, so that's at least part of the uh, tip that I can give you. Uh, John Dunham says, how easy would it be to change the color of the grass surface texture, i.e. not changing the texture, but the shade of the color within it? All right, that's an interesting question. Um, so, some of the surfaces have the ability to be changed with by changing the color chip. You know, there's a color chip. You can see these color chips right here. Um, and you can change that color chip, and it will change in the menu. Some of them will actually change um, in the uh, actual um, representation, but not many of them. Um, it's not a, a, a trivial thing. Uh, so one of the things that you might consider doing um, certainly is always a foolproof way is to get the texture file from the library and uh, then um, open it up in a photo editing tool and tint it, change the color, um, and then load the new version of that with a new name so that you have access to it. Uh, so today I won't have time to try to demonstrate those processes, but that would be a way to do it. Uh, and John, we can talk about that in the ARCAD coaching program. Um, as well. Uh, Tom says, are the improved surfaces auto-included when opening a new AC23 project? Yeah, they are. So when you open a new project using the standard ARCAD23 um, environment or template, you will get them. Now, if you have master template, I'm preparing the upgrade for that, and I will be having all of those new surfaces available. So that's part of the task that I have. Uh, there's more things that I'm doing. Let's talk about templates. You know, so when we bring a, a template uh, forward, what do we need to think about? Um, all right, so, oh, and let me see what other questions there were here. Okay, so a uh, comment from earlier, Rex Prater says, RK23 is faster on MacBook Pro running Catalina already, still learning some of the things. Okay, um, Steve Pribble says, en enlarging a drawing window on a layout now requires a click as to whether I want to update the entire drawing or just the enlarged area. That's annoying. Maybe there's a setting to circumvent this. That's interesting. I remember seeing something mentioned there. They're trying to optimize saying, hey, maybe you have maybe you have a, um, a very large set of information and you're putting just an excerpt of it. And it's asking, you know, do you want to update just that area or the whole thing? And of course, the idea is that you're going to be um, saving time if this, if the rest of it would takes time. Maybe it's a, a, an elevation and it takes 90 seconds to update that elevation, but it can update just the little detail of the entry in five seconds. You know, so uh, I guess that's what the intention is. But I don't know if um, there's uh, what the, the options are there. That's interesting. All right, Rich Matthews says, just open an Arcad 22 file, the same as the last troublesome one in Arcad 23, and everything is fine. It may have been how I opened in 23 the first time around. Okay, well, glad to hear that, Rich. Um, Dan Wyckoff says, I have an Arcad Plus subscription and have not received any notice of 23 being released. Is everyone on a beta version? No, it was released as of maybe the 20th or 25th of September. So we're talking three weeks ago, roughly, um, somewhere in there. Uh, you should have gotten an email. If you didn't, then either 
it went it got caught in spam so you didn't see it or they you know, maybe they have an outdated email address uh, now what I found is that uh, you um, you can download our kit 23 uh, let's see I can give people a link let's see um, well just email me or, or well email your reseller um, and just say, hey, you know, what do I need to do? Because you should get an email with a link to download our CAD 23 and um, and your key. Actually, I found it was automatically updated. It, I didn't have to run through a process. It just sort of knew, oh, Eric, you've got a subscription. Okay, let's upgrade your key. Bang. You know, it was painless. Um, all right, so Diego says, are you working on the new 23 version template? Yes, I am. And uh, I should have a workable version. In other words, it's something that you can use um, uh, within the next few days, uh, probably by Monday. Um, and I'm aiming to have a full, you know, the, let's say the final version, you know, the uh, with the new features incorporated by the end of October. So just two weeks from now is my aim. Um, you know, I've already been doing work on it, have a pretty good sense of what uh, are the pieces that need to be done. So I'll be talking a little bit about um, template migration shortly. Uh, Breton says, 3D mouse rolling, Australian version is the opposite, strange. Okay. Um, all right, interesting. Um, okay, Jay says, migration is many duplicates with UI list names. So that's if you're um, loading in a, the migration library and um, have, uh, well, if you're migrating an old project, you may very well get duplicates. The UI list is user interface list. Generally, you can ignore that. Um, now, you're starting something fresh, you won't have those. Or if you, uh, you can go and remove duplicates if you're loading some old libraries. Um, so that's something that I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. Uh, so Walter Chongo says, how can I ed edit the story numbers, story zero to story one? So you can't edit the story numbers. Um, basically, if you're using the international version, then stories, uh, then the ground floor that you start on is story zero. And if you add a story above it, of course, it becomes story one. In all cases, if you add a story below the ground floor, it'll be story minus one. Uh, now, if you prefer to work with the American standard, it sounds like you want it to be a story one, uh, then you might want to load the US version. And so uh, you could ask your GraphSoft reseller if you can get that. I'm not sure where you're located um, and whether you're an American possibly working abroad or, or vice versa. Um, now, when you are putting a drawing on a sheet, you have the option to name the drawing anything you like. So you can call it ground floor, you can call it lower level, you can call it uh, main floor, you can call it first floor, whatever you want. We don't see the number of the story on uh, necessarily on the title. So it's not a big deal. You just have to, when you're looking in the project map, you'll see a number and just be aware of, of that. I mean, I can imagine if you were working on an American project and you were, it's a 10 story building and it said zero to nine, it might be a little bit annoying, um, but you could still name the stories one through 10. All right, um, Jay says, can warning slow a file down? I don't think so, not if it's just duplicated or substituted objects. They're essentially saying, just wanted to let you know in case maybe I don't understand your situation perfectly, I substituted these things. Once it's substituted, it's running at full speed. But if you said, oh God, look, this looks different. And I'll tell you one thing that looked different when I migrated this master template. So we have a whole kit of parts off to the side and there's some commercial project samples, you know, a lobby with an elevator and there's offices and things like that. And these are things that you can quickly bring into a project and adapt to your needs. They're just intended to be a good quick starting point for certain types of layouts for rest, commercial restrooms, et cetera. So the elevator was, uh, it, it actually has a new, in version 23, it has a new option for matching the building material. So you can say um, the building core, this is a certain type of concrete um, and it'll match that appearance. 
and if you uh, when it substituted that elevator uh, all of a sudden it became very gray whereas I had it just painted white I had a white surface so I had to manually go in and change um, change that uh, but it, getting back to the original question it, d it doesn't seem to slow anything down all right Brenton says any chance you can repeat how to set the previous mouse zoom method okay so if I'm in the Archicad, I go to Options, Work Environment. It is under uh, Input Constraints and Guides, which is an odd place, except that Input Constraints relate to what you're doing with inputting via the mouse. So these are things like whether you are going to snap to the horizontal and vertical um, or other, some other angle that maybe is of interest. Down here, it has the mouse wheel scrolling and the magic mouse trackpad scrolling. So this is the one that I want to change. I did it in the US version, now I'm doing it in the international one, um, to say when I scroll my with my finger, I want it to zoom in and out. And then if I use the option key, um, then I can pan um, left or right or up or down here. And I guess this would be an option um, here for other types where you have a mouse wheel as opposed to a surface um, there. Okay, um, Rich Matthews says, would it be best to delete the imported surfaces and add the Archaea 23 surfaces and then close and reopen and append the older surfaces, which gives the latest index number priority? Okay, so um, let, let's um, look at that in context of migrating master template and I'll show you some things that at least will give you some tools and Mark Bly says, can you reshow briefly how to update to the Archive 23 template with Attribute Manager again, please? Okay, so I'm going to actually answer both of your questions um, here. So um, if I go to, um, here is the Archive, um my migrated project uh, here, you know, which, as I said, looks okay. Um, it now has a couple of new uh, surfaces that I've done. So if I go to the Options Attribute Manager or Options Element Attributes Attribute Manager, then I can again say that I'd like to look at surfaces in this case, go here to open another file to look at it. Now I am in the US version and uh, I'm going to go into the US Archicad 23 template and so we'll see I think I brought in this masonry one here but uh, these other ones probably haven't been changed so in master template the actually that's right I already did do this import um, here uh, so that's that's what I did here. Yeah, so I basically, just to reiterate, um, I selected, uh, you actually, if, if you click in the name and you do Command or Control A, it'll select the whole name. But if you click on the color chip or the number here, then if you do Command or Control A, it'll select all of the items in that list going down. And then you can go click on bring it in by index and it'll then bring them in and overwrite everything in those numbers. Now, what um, in terms of uh, Rich, your your question, how would you uh, best do it? What I've done sometimes is I've gone. Uh, let's just say, if I wanted to take things and move them to a new index position. So what does that mean? I, I want to keep the definitions of these things, but I want to have them be in a new um, a new place to make room possibly for some things that need to be brought in then what I'll do is I'll X out of this so I'll, I'll close this temporary file I'll start with a blank one and uh, maybe I'll go down I want to take let's just take this top one here 348 and I'll bring this in by index now what that's doing is it's creating in this temporary file a um, an index of this number now I can take as many of these as I want. I'll just take the first, you know, um, 
uh, well, from 201 to 210, just as an example, and I will append them to this. Now, when I append them, you'll see they go at a higher index number. And so these now, these um, uh, surfaces now exist in this temporary file and uh, they have higher index numbers. Now, if I wanted to move these down to a new position, and so this is a little bit more of an advanced technique just for people like Rich who've been around for a while, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm now gonna select these 10 here and I will go and append them to the list. And what, what did that do? It added them to the end of this list. Now you notice that it has um, th these numbers, one or two at the end, because these are now duplicate names. So it starts with the block one here. So now having um, done that, if I wanted my project to use this index, then what I would do is I would go in to find the, the block one here, let's see, um, this block, and I will delete it. Now, when I say delete, you can see this little check mark. It's used by some element. When I say delete, they'll say, do you want to just delete it and have it be missing? Or do you want to tell any element that uses this to use another one? And I'll say, let me get the one that was at the end, the block um, uh, here. Where is it? It's block CMU. Here, you notice this is gray, that's the one I'm deleting, and I'm saying use the one with a one at the end, which is the new one at the end, so I'll say replace. And you see it got rid of the 201. Let me just do one more here. The English bond one, I'm going to delete and replace with the brick English bond one. So here's, there's 10 of them, you know, in a, in a couple of minutes, I could just delete each one and replace it with the ones at the new part of the list and then say OK. So basically, we, we don't need to keep this file around, but this is a way of bringing something out to another file with a new index number and then bringing it back in to the position we want and then, um, and then doing a delete and replace for these elements um, so that you end up clearing out that space then you can go potentially bring in all the Graphisoft ones without worrying about how they work. So that's actually the way that I work with Master Template is I make sure that I don't have any conflicts with the Graphisoft ones. I make sure that every version of Master Template has all the Graphisoft stuff and then a lot more um, by making sure that I have compatibility with Graphisoft uh, environment it means that you can migrate a project from the Graphisoft standard template into master template pretty easily because all of the, those index numbers are the same. Um, so that's, you know, just part of the way I try to make it easier for people. Um, all right. So hopefully that gives you some idea. I just canceled because I, I didn't want to um, play around with that, but that would uh, hopefully answers that question. Don Dunham, you should be able to quickly scroll the info bar box at the top of the window from left to right and back again, but now it's totally static. Um, okay, so here is the info box. I have the wall tool active. With the wall tool, there's quite a bit of information, which means that off to the right here, there's more things that aren't seen. I can use my mouse. Um, uh, so I have a magic mouse. So the magic mouse, as I said, does not have a scroll wheel. It has a surface. And one of the nice things about it, aside from it looking sleek and cool, is that you can actually scroll left and right. So I can scroll left and right here. I'm actually just moving my finger one way or another. Now, if you want to do it more visually, you can pull this down. You can see as I move my mouse over the uh, divider, I can pull this down a little bit. And then we get the scroll bar. And then I can do the same thing. I can just grab this and move it here. And then the other tip, a lot of people say that this is limiting and that they'd rather see all of it easily. And you can grab the title part of this, so just the, right at the edge here, and bring it into view and then dock it by putting it next to the toolbox. And now we see that we don't have that strip at the top. We have all of this information here. And in general, 
it's going to show a more complete representation and you may have no scrolling necessary or just the tiniest bit of scrolling necessary um, so you know I, I think that actually is a very effective way to do it but hopefully I answered both of your questions there um, okay and I don't know so John I see you're typing in something here um, so I have the magic mouse too but I don't even see the scroll bar at the bottom of my window so um, in terms of a scroll bar, so obviously I had this, um, uh, there's no scroll bars here, you're right, there's no scroll bars on the side. This is an option under the window menu, show scroll bar. So if you want this, you can say show scroll bar, and you can see now we can see this here, and this little tiny scroll bar here. Um, so it's uh, it's not taking the whole bottom, but it's to the right of all these other controls um, <coughs> here. So uh, these are some of the interface things that you can do. If you if you like, you can use this. And of course, this probably makes more sense on the floor plan than in 3D. Um, but if we were to zoom in um, on an area and then say, uh, you know, I need to move over a little bit, I can, you know, the problem is it's a little hard to control. I just move the tiniest bit and it jumps out of view. And this one, likewise, yeah, it's very, a little hard to control. So in general, what I like doing is using the center mouse button to pad. So I've got the hand key and I can move this around or using the cursor keys. Now this is something that was added into ArcCAD quite a few years ago, but if you're an older user, um, you may not have known that it was added, and even if you are a newer user, you may not know about it. I can use the up arrow, just repeatedly, to move up, the down arrow to move down, and the left to move left, and the right to move right. So those cursor keys, which are available on you know any keyboard, um, will, by default, nudge your view a little bit one way. Um, so Bob Schwenke says, on the large keyboard, the cursor keys work great. Um, so John says, I sorry I meant the scroll bar under the info box. Well, as I've mentioned a little before here, putting this back on top, there's no, oh, that's interesting, it, it has disappeared. Oh, that's, here, okay, I'm, well, wow, let's see, I'm having this um, palette lost control of that. Let's uh, here. So you can see at the top left of my screen that the ARCAD window is here and the actual palette is, um, I've lost the title bar when I did that. So this is one of those rare cases where um, I don't think there's any way when it goes off to another screen for me to go grab it. So I will need to use the work environment and restore. If I go into one of these lower sections, I'll go to the um, workspace schemes. And the workspace schemes record where your palettes are. And right now it's in a custom mode and I'm, I've lost control of it. So I'm going to put it back into the standard workspace and apply it. And what this will do is it'll move all of the palettes around to what Graphisoft ships. And you can see now my info box is at the top and this little tiny, tiny control strip is now, I could grab it. But to answer your question, Don, just go between, move your mouse up in this area, move it down slightly until you see this little adjustment symbol then drag it down, and when you drag it down just uh, enough, you'll see the scroll bar show up here, and then you can grab the scroll bar. But even without that, if you use the magic mouse, I can be pointing up in this area and roll the mouse here. Okay, so, um, so there are some general tips aside from migration. So let's just talk. Um, we're already at the hour 20 mark, so I, I don't want it to go... Um, more than two hours, and I was expecting this would be more like 90 minutes. So let's see 
what I can answer in the next you know, 10 or 20 minutes. So when you're working with a template, you're basically defining your office standard for projects uh, that you start up. And whether you use the Graphisoft standard template as a starting point or master template or another commercial template, you're gonna need to customize it to have things like your company information on the title block, to get schedules the way you like the schedules, to set up the structure of your layout book the way you generally do it, so that when you start any project, those things don't have to be redone. So one of the standard uh, best practices methods that I teach involves saying analyzing your workflow and saying, what can you do once that you won't have to do again? So in other words, if you set it up properly, how can you avoid redoing the same sort of things? And that involves a lot of different things. The template, if you always opened up the Graphisoft template and had to go and create a new title block, put your company information there, well, that's sort of silly. You might as well, when you start up a project, have the title block with your company name there. If you always like changing the layout book numbering system to a certain way, you might as well do that once in a blank project and save it as a template so that you can then um, start up your projects and it's already set up. So doing things once rather than redoing them is important. And this also involves things like favorites. Um, so once you've set up your standard wall assemblies that you use frequently, make sure that you have favorites for them. The types of windows and the settings for casement and, and trim and, and et cetera that you commonly use, create favorites for them. And then it becomes much quicker to just say, oh, I'll need you know, a living room picture window, a um, XOX window. Um, now, in the template, you'll definitely want to, if you already have a customized template, uh, that you've worked with or you have master template or something uh, that you've customized, uh, then when you go to version 23, you have two main choices. You can either start with the base template supplied by Graphisoft or master template or another one and then customize it again. Or you can take your template forward and then bring in those surfaces, et cetera, um, and make whatever... Um, changes allow you to take full advantage of 23. So you'll want to make sure it's loading the 23 library. Um, ideally, you want to make it so it doesn't need to load the migration library uh, so that it, you're a little bit lighter um, that way. Uh, so you'll need to update uh, those things. Um, now in master template, so this is a sample project, I'll just show you that in the library manager right now, we're loading the ARCAD migration libraries, which are 689 megabytes. That's a huge amount for ARCAD to catalog and just sort of figure out what all these things are. If we could eliminate that, it would probably start up the file a little bit faster. Um, the standard library is now almost a gigabyte, 894 megabytes. Now the in, embedded library here is 37 megabytes. That's inside the file, makes the file bigger, but it, of course it has very quick access to that. Now, what's in the embedded library? Well, if you are starting out with a standard ARCHICAD template and you build a model or run your projects, you're probably going to create some custom library parts here and there. Those would go into the embedded library. And so it might only be, it might be zero, it might be a few hundred kilobytes or a few megabytes. The reason why this is larger is within that master template, you know, we have some resources that I supply to help make certain things look, um, you know, work the way I think will be easier. We also, as I've moved forward, I've, I've basically found that there were some things that Graphisoft removed that I think really are useful. And so making the decision for my own use and for people who buy Master Template, I've kept in, you know, things like the stop valve um, or the profile sheet. So this is actually sort of corrugated sh surface that worked pretty well up through maybe version 20, I think. And then in 21, 
their replacement version I found was really screwy. It seemed buggy. So I've just put it into master template, kept it around. There's some things with rafters that I liked from the earlier version. Um, a grease trap, you know, a column grid indicator, you know, these things um, are just ones that I chose to keep in master template um, there. Now, an interesting one is the telephone. In 22, they actually pulled the old office telephone. You could not find it in the library. Um, so if you wanted to have an office appearance with uh, an office phone where you could, you know, punch buttons for a touch tone and you could, you know, switch between the extensions and things like that. Um, it was something maybe, maybe it was from the 90s, maybe it was from, you know, 2010, I don't know. Uh, it wasn't really ancient looking, but they just maybe decided, oh, people don't use these phones anymore. They use their cell phone. Well, I think it's nice to have some of those things. So I put that in. Well, they brought it back into 23. So now there is a telephone 23. It looks just like the 21, although it it has a different origin point. So in um, in my master template project, I had to replace the telephones one by one from the old legacy 21 to the 23 and just move them back on the desk because they were they sort of offset. And there's a towel bar that they had that to me was quite useful and they don't have that one anymore. So these are ones here. Um, there are other things for 2D detail, um, uh, you know, creating 2D details uh, that were um, included up through version 20. Um, there were stairs and railings that were objects before they switched over to the new stairs and railings. So all of these ones were ones that I decided would be helpful for Arcade users, and so we've retained them. And that's why the embedded library has a little bit of weight. But when you are um, moving your template forward, you need to look and say, hey, for example, do I need you know, this part? Or are some of these parts maybe, can I substitute the new, new things? Um, so you'll want to um, ideally pare down your embedded library where you can, add to it things that you go, hmm, I don't want to live without that. Graphisoft removed it from the standard library, and it's in the migration library. And what you can do is you can say, I want to take this migration library. It says that there are 25 placed objects that are in this project. So these are 25 elements somewhere in the project that have been um, that are being supported by the migration library. So instead of loading 689 megabytes, I'm going to go and embed the placed objects of the selected library. So that means everything that was in um, uh, that was placed here, I'm going to bring in and we'll get rid of this. So I'll say embed it. It says, do we want to embed textures? Yeah, I'll say do that as well in case um, we need them. I'll say embed. So it'll take a few seconds. This item will disappear from the list. We will no longer be loading 689 megabytes. And the embedded library will have a new folder with 25 parts, apparently. Um, and most likely, the warnings will go down because they won't have the duplicates there. You know, embed more than 100 library parts, I'll say go ahead, um, say OK. Um, and we'll see this in a moment, what happens here. All right. so. There are actually, the warnings didn't go away. There's still some duplicated parts um, here from the user interface. I guess um, that I'd have to manually go uh, figure out. But there's no missing library parts. It has everything it needs. And this went from 34 megabytes to 37. So I basically loaded three more megabytes in the file, but I'm not loading that entire migration library. So that is something that um, you, know, you generally would want to do. We shouldn't see any changes here. We shouldn't see any issues when we embed. Uh, now, it's not smart enough to embed things that are referred to in the favorites palette. So if we go to the um, window menu palettes favorites, we may find, um, let's just do a marker, because I know this is one that can be an issue here. Um, we may find that the automatic embedding does not, um, let's see, it wouldn't be, I'm just going to go back to the arrow tool so it'll 
it'll show uh, things beyond just one tool. Um, so let's just see here. It's giving me a spinning ball, taking a little bit of time to think about it. Um, okay, so you can see these with question marks here. Uh, so these are windows that are referring to markers that are not loaded anymore because they were in the, um, the migration library, but they're not, uh, not anymore. So what you want to do is you want to go and right click on favorites that have this question mark, say edit it, and the window itself looks fine, but the dimension marker is missing. So I would just need to go and say, well, let me just use the window marker 23 and let me make it set, you know, do I want it to be a circle or um, a square rotated, you know, for example, um, here. Uh, and what, what, how do I want this to be set? So you basically go and reset these markers. It's a little bit annoying for Windows um, uh, because you can't use a favorite here. You have to manually set it. But I could select a bunch of these uh, windows, assuming that I wanted all of them to be, uh, let me just cancel out of this. I can select a bunch of windows here and right click, say edit. And while I'm not going to change the type of window, because there are various ones, I can go to the dimension marker and change them all and get them all cleaned up. So everything that's a window, I can clean up in one go. So once you've done that, then basically um, popping in, you know, window or door won't have an issue with the, the marker. Um, so Bob uh, writes, I uh, can't find the electrical symbols that are in version 12, so I migrate that library. That's interesting. So one thing to be aware of is um, if I just go to the uh, object tool. So electrical symbols and lamps are related. You know, you have power and light, right? Um, so just to make it clear, you will find electrical symbols um, in the object library. So if I open this up and I do, you know, elect here, you should probably see some things um, that appear. Um, it's getting a spinning ball. Um, so here we can see various uh, symbols with here. If we go to, um, do we have one that was outlet two? Okay, so this this is uh, w these would be standard electrical symbols that I'm thinking of or GFCI. If we then go to click over here to look in the folder, now we'll see all of these and they are basic electrical items 23. So I'm not sure if the version 12 had different ones than this, but this is where you would find them there. Um, okay, so um, going back to some questions from a few minutes ago, Rich Matthews says, does the deleted file also transfer all its attributes to the replaced item? So when I was doing the delete and replace, what it does is it says anything that's in your file, it doesn't affect any other project files or templates, but anything in that file that refers to this attribute, like you know this particular surface, tell it to use the new surface. Okay. Same thing with layers. You say anything that's on a particular layer, I want to delete that layer because it's redundant. Um, then you say delete the layer, and anything that's on that layer gets reassigned to the new layer. Now. With surfaces, they have uh, a fill associated. So if you wanted to show line work in an elevation, it would come up. But the um, uh, you're not actually telling it to use anything else other than the new reference. You're basically saying the elements that have that or that have a surface, you know, one side of the wall is this particular surface, use the new one. So that's that's all you're getting. So it's a powerful thing, but it doesn't transfer all of the attributes of one surface into another. All right, um, Angela says, how much is a complete class to get a certification in the program? 
So if you're interested in a comprehensive training for ARCHICAD, I do have what's called the ARCHICAD Best Practices course. And the new version that I'm uh, creating now is called the ARCHICAD Best Practices 2020 course. It's currently on sale for $697, $700. Um, and you can get full information on it at archicadtraining.com forward slash 2020. So archicadtraining.com, where I've been putting my new courses in a slash and then 2020. Um, it's the old version of the course is fully, you know, it's been out for a while. I'm revamping things to make sure everything's up to date. And that's about a little over halfway done. Um, and it will be done in the first half of 2020. So go to arcadetraining.com slash 2020. All right, Nicholas says, Mr. Eric. Well, hello, Nicholas. Um, Francois from South Africa. Just note that the info bar int does not show all elements settings. Um, can it be activated to show all settings in the info bar as in full elements settings? Let me show you how you can adjust that. Um, and Tom says, uh, I have master template 22. Do I need to pay again for 23? Um, you can buy an upgrade. Uh, so if you purchased master template 23 after or 22 after September 1st, so six weeks ago, I'll give you a free upgrade. If you purchased it, you know, earlier this year or last year, uh, then you pay. Uh, master template, uh, normal price, list price is $397. Um, I've just set up a promotion, so it's $297 for new users uh, through the end of October. Um, you can email me at support at bobro.com. If you're upgrading from an earlier version, the upgrades are $147 but the info price is 97. And so I did send a note to everybody uh, on my list um, uh, about the upgrade to master template, but I will be sending a special one to people who've already purchased it and just talking about what's new. And uh, so you can get it for 97 bucks. Um, all right, so let's see, I think that's all the, oh no, Jay says, when you look at twin motion, tell me if you see that linked roofs are partially transparent. Have I seen that? Interesting. All right. Well, it'd be good to at least talk about twin motion a little bit because that's, oh, well, fantastic new thing. Um, so we can do a little quick test there. And Francois, uh, your question about um, the info box. So the info box, when we're in, um, uh, here, here's, an example, um, I'm gonna go to the roof tool. Okay, so the roof tool has a lot of different settings that you can play around with. Only some of them are shown in the info box here. I scroll through this, I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do, but for example, there's nothing um, here that says uh, what happens with the lines that are overhead you know, do you want them to be dashed or some other way of representing that the roof is above your current story? Here, there's no way to see that. Now, if I go to the roof tool and open it up, we again don't have anything that says something about the line over the top of the, the story. Now, you may not know that it's there. You may have never thought about it, but I found that some of the default settings had little dots so instead of dashes that were visible, it was dots. And like, I don't like that. It looks weird. How do I change it? Well, it turns out that you have to go in to your work environment. So options, work environment. And by the way, this is just in the standard US version um, here. Uh, I don't know what it's like in the international, but uh, since Francois brings it up, it, it, similar things. So if I go to the options, work environment, this is on what's called the toolbar or the info box and uh, the tool settings dialog boxes. So let's look at the info box here. And let's look at the roof tool. It actually brought that up automatically because the roof tool was active. You see all of these things with little closed eyes. So for example, there is the overhead line. I'm gonna turn just that one thing on. I mean, of course, there's a whole bunch of these. So I'll say, okay. Uh, now that's on the info box. So that's the one that is across the top of the screen or 
along the side. And then there's the tool settings dialog boxes for roofs. And um, now this does actually say that it's got the floor plan and section there. But in fact, I don't think it includes this line thing. That was something that took me a while to track down. Even though you can, this is turned on, it doesn't have that information. Let's just say OK. And now if I open up the, um, if I look in the roof settings, there's an option here for overhead line. Look at this dotted dense. So let's let me draw something here. Um, uh, or actually, let's go to the uh, upper story. Let's go here to the second floor one. Okay, so here's um, here are the roofs. I'm going to just select these two two roofs. This is a, a different color or different designation because it's part of a new uh, sort of addition to the building um, here. And I'll go into the the um, settings here, um, and the uh, I'll say that I want to show it on. I'll just say all stories right now. Right now, it's, it's it, I think it's set to show just on its home story and above. I'll say all stories, and then um, the in this project I've already set it to be um, a dashed line. The default was this dotted dense. So let me set this to the dotted dense. And what that's going to do is it'll show you the problem in the standard U.S. template, I believe. Um, Anyway, at least when, when I last looked at it, maybe it's changed. If I now go to the lower story, um, oh, actually, you know what? It's the it's the uh, it's that layer as well. Let me just drop down to the lower story without changing layers. And now what you'll see is that there's this weird line here. You can see that um, the the roof is showing. Let me let me also select the two roofs and um, change them so that they don't show the uh, on the floor plan, floor plan display here. This is going to be all stories, but I want to do it custom here. So I'll say that on the fill, I don't want to show this at all. So in other words, I don't want to show this sort of hatch pattern. I only want to show the outline um, here. So now I say OK, and you'll see that the roof now, in a moment, after it's spinning big beach ball changes, um, we can see that I can select these, but when I deselect them, look at this, it's just got these weird little dots. Let me make it um, true line weight so we can see it maybe a little better. No, it's still, these are tiny dots. You can't even see the darn things. So I will select this. Now, how do I change this to make it dashed? If I go into the roof settings um, here, there's no place to change the overhead line. It's not in here. It's not in the model, not in the floor plan and section. It's not there. But because I've added it to the info box here, I now can change it from dotted dense to something more reasonable. It'll be, say, a uh, dashed dense. And now when I deselect it, you can see we've got the dashed line. So that's an example of something that was frustrating because A, you, you could select these things and you couldn't change it in the roof settings, nor could you see it in the info box. And I had to actually go into the work environment and change it to um, show it at least in the info box. And then, you know, in this case, for this project, just get it to work the way I want it. But there you go. That's what you'd need to do, um, Francois, to get more things to show in the info box. And you could turn on all of the things uh, with little eyeballs. But beware, you know, you may have a rather, rather long thing that um, you need to scroll through. Uh, so play around with that. Uh, once you've got it set the way you want, let's say, uh, or at any point you want to just record that, if we go into the, um, let's say, the info box here, um, and we've got that set where, I've, I've say, the overhead line is turned on, I can go to the tool schemes, 
and then say I want to save this tool scheme and I'll store it and I'll just call it um, uh, archicad user um, October 2019. So this is just recording a version that I was using today. And you can have as many of these as you like, but generally you're going to want to have one preferred one that you use most of the time. And this sets up your tool settings dialog boxes and your toolbox, uh, your info box the way you want it. Um, and even the toolbox, sort of how your tools are arranged. So hopefully that answers that for Francois. Um, Chris Dvorak said, what is, wait, that is frustrating. And so you have to change the work environment. Um, yes, it is. Um, Jay Garbarino, you can rearrange the items in the info box. Most may already know that. Very good point. So for example, if I'm going to the window tool and I want to renumber windows manually, so, you know, going around the, the project and saying, I want to number them, you know, five, six, seven, eight, et cetera. Well, um, let's just go around here. So if I uh, select, you know, this window, where do I find the ID? Well, of course, I can open up the settings of the window and I can go down to the classifications and properties. And here is um, the ID, W08, and I can change it there. In the info box, it's way over in the other end. We'll just, uh, got a spinning ball. Here, you can see it's over at the other end. Well, that's annoying. Let me just go to the work environment info box and say that for Windows, I'd like to take the ID and properties and grab the little double arrow on and just drag it up. And I might put it right at the beginning. The same thing with the door tool, because these are the ones that you tend to want to renumber. So go down here, grab the ID and properties, drag it up there say OK. And now when I'm in the window tool, there's the number. When I'm in the door tool, similarly, um, it will have the number. You know, it doesn't have to be the far left, but wherever you want to put it, um, you can rearrange it. So very good point, Jay. And again, that would be retained until you change it, but you might want to save it in a, a tool scheme um, so that you can always restore it. Francois says, in international, you can set the overhead lines globally in project preferences legacy. So in the options menu, project preferences legacy, you do have some controls if you um, want to change this for, um, for certain things. Now, this is for slabs, meshes, and objects. It does not allow you to do it for roofs. See? I don't think that's different in the international version, but maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think it's only for these. Um, and uh, then there's some things if you do want to use certain types of calculations for representing things in 3D um, or on plan here. Um, in any event, uh, that gives you a variety of tips there to work with. Uh, twin motion. Let's just see if I can do something more just for fun here. So twin motion, if I go back to the Graphisoft site. All right, one of the cool things is, uh, where do they have it? Twin motion. And if you look at it, I mean, it looks just so much more realistic. I mean, it's still like a computer game, but it's much more realistic. It's softer shadows and reflections and things like that. Now, I can't in twin motion edit my model, but I can get the model from ARCHICAD into twin motion relatively quickly and dress it up by putting in people and uh, other things like this waving flag. You can have cars driving by. You can see water moving, you know, effects, even the trees can be moving a little bit. And these, uh, things you're adding to your model. So you've got a design that's architectural that you're going to build, but you're adorning it or dressing it up to make it look, you know, nice, maybe more like a, prod, uh, a building in use than just something that's just been constructed and nobody's ever touched it. Um, so how do you use it? Well, today I'm not going to be teaching that, and Graphisoft does have some interesting uh, webinars and, and training on this. 
but let's just see, give myself this last little challenge question. So basically, if you go follow these links, you can install it. It ends up being an application that you put into your computer. And then when you're in Archicad um, here, there is a twin motion menu that shows up um, here. And why is it direct link not available? Settings here, connection. Okay, I don't know. So why is that twin motion direct link? Um, well, let me just start up twin motion here because um, it is a um, an application um, here. So it is starting up. Um, and it's basically going to start up with a blank project and a little guide to navigation. Um, so we'll see just an empty area with a background image here. Now if I go back to the ArcCAD here and we go to Twin Motion, it still doesn't have the direct link. Now, why? I know that I had this um, going before. Let me just go to the other ArchiCAD here. Uh, well, let's go to the US one. And uh, all right, so I, I don't have much of anything. I just have um, a box of walls uh, here. So if I go to Twin Motion, yeah, direct link. Now, I don't know why it's in one and the other. Maybe it only allows you to link from one ArchiCAD instance. But if I say direct link, um, and I'll say that it's going to be, uh, it's synchronizing with Twin Motion here. Um, and I need to say it's a new project rather than this one, or it's going into this existing one. I'll say OK. And it'll bring this in. And of course, there it looks like it. So not very impressive, but it uh, will have the ability to be bringing in things like landscape. So we'll say vegetation here. And I can literally just drag in, you know, a tree um, here and change settings of it, like the size um, here, um, like that. You can change the season, um, you know, so winter it's going to look different, um, etc. Um, so that is, that's the, the tiniest little example of how you bring it in. And uh, I will need to get more familiar with it. Um, but it's not my intention to become an expert on twin motion. Uh, and I think Graphisoft is sharing some good resources on, on how to use it. Um, okay, so, uh, so Rick says 3D view. Let's go to, ah, okay, thank you. Maybe I was just not thinking, I'm in a 3D window now. Go to twin motion. Direct link, thank you very much, Rick. Appreciate that. Go here, we'll say, give me a new project. Okay. Do I want to save? No, I don't need this one. No. Um, here, let's just see how long that takes. Um, well, let's see. Um, we're in this project. Uh, not sure this is this looks like a path that it is in the project here we go okay I can rotate around um, and move out oh look at that hey um, and I think how, how do I do this I am a little vague on the navigation oh, there it is okay so I can move around and look at that um, and that tree <laughs> it looks like um, Get rid of that tree. Oh, I actually, I selected the ground plane. Can I undo that? Okay, so this ground plane, uh, yeah, so you can select these surfaces. And uh, I guess if I hit escape, yeah, now there's nothing highlighted. Okay, so um, it doesn't look exactly the same as I had it. Um, uh, let's see if I can uh, move around. So I haven't really gotten familiar with this. As you can tell, I'm sort of stumbling. But thank you, Rick. It only took maybe 10 seconds to move over. And I guess the good thing is let's go back here and say, oh, you know what? This, um, uh, uh, let me just get rid of this guy here. Um, oh, come on, get rid of, 
that. Okay, so now if I go back to Twin Motion and say direct link, um, will this work? So I think we have to save this, which I, I guess I'll just save it as um, 105 test here. And, and then twin motion. Let me show the palette here. This palette, which the uh, floating around, this is synchronized with twin motion. And I'm not sure what these twin motion community and synchronization settings. Let me just go back to twin motion now. And it's got a spinning ball. And let's see if it works. Fingers crossed. So let's see if there are any other comments while we uh, while I'm waiting here. Okay. Uh, Dan Wyckoff says the characters in Twin Motion are very poor. Will that change with the non-free version? The characters? You're talking about human figures? Uh, I'm not sure. All right, Eric Reinhardt thanks me and Francois. Okay, pointing out that several people said that I had to be in the 3D window. <laughs> okay, several several people. Um, okay. Um, and Brenton says, can't see the Twin Motion link in the top bar of the Australian version. I'm not sure. So uh, you would need to install Twin Motion to do that. Um, and Lawrence says, copy paste your other project into the arcade with direct link to Twin Motion. So that was a good suggestion, but in this case, it was just I wasn't in the 3D window. Um, and you, and uh, Steve says, parts of the roof seem to be transparent in Twin Motion. That's interesting. This upper roof here. You're right. And by the way, I'm still getting a spinning beach ball, so I I don't quite know what's going on. Obviously, it's not finishing. Now there might be some message. I don't see a message here. Um, clicked on this synchronize. Oh, here's synchronization, and it's doing it. So. Not quite sure what I needed to do, do, do differently, but that, yeah, that parts of that roof seem to be transparent. Um, okay. And he also, Jay says, just go back to twin motion and it resyncs. Okay. Um, but it is doing something here on screen. Um, so there's definitely some learning curve and I haven't gone through it yet. So, uh, Francois says the transparent surface in twin motion means the surface in twin motion must simply be set to double sided. Okay, so let us see if I go back now to twin motion, has it um, updated? Okay, I was trying to get twin motion in front. Twin motion is not coming up, so it may still be hung. So I don't really know. All right. So um, Eric Gedney says, I'm finding that the trees are so good in twin motion that I would remove those from the ARCAD model before importing. Absolutely, the trees are so much better. A trick that um, Eric Mark, Mark Benner uh, showed in our ARCAD user webinar in August was that he places simple trees, even just lollipop type of schematic trees, where he wants the trees, where they're exist on the site or where they're going to be planted. And then in uh, twin motion, you can substitute twin motion ones for them. And I can't remember whether you just select them and you, you know, say swap this out, or you can say place one in place of it and then hide the original. There's some option there. So he, he will do that. So instead of just leaving them out, he brings them in to locate them precisely. All right. Uh, Andy Travers just tried the roof overhead line type, and it's the same issue in the international version. That's a good tip for getting rid of the dotted lines. What is the cost of twin motion going to be? I have no idea. It's free for the next year, as far as I know. Um, 
so I, I don't know. I know that uh, it, the technology was sold and transferred, and now Epic Games owns this whole technology, and they're bringing in their Unreal Engine, which probably I'm guessing maybe even higher quality visualization than you know than what I'm seeing right now. Uh, I'm not quite sure. And so for the next year, use it. And of course, I'm sure they want to get more people to be excited about it and get perhaps tens of thousands of ArchiCAD users to go, I can't live without it. And who knows, maybe their cost will be modest. Maybe they'll say, you know, like computer games, how much is a computer game? Is it 50 bucks or 100 bucks? I don't really know, but, you know, I don't think they're, if they're a gaming company that they would be saying charge you a thousand dollars for a rendering tool but that's just my guess um, all right so uh, francois uh, thanks for the tip about the surface and twin motion must simply be set to be double-sided <clears throat> so we'll have to check that out when i'm able to proceed and jay says uh um sorry for the twin motion rabbit trail i even swapped the roof material with a twin motion material and it's still transparent. So Jay, see if you can um, do the, where, Francois, maybe you can tell us where do you set it to be double-sided in twin motion? Um, and I would bring up twin motion, but it seems to be hung. Um, so let me just force quit on, on uh, twin motion here, not responding here. Um, Communication error, <laughs> okay, yeah. And let's see if I go in um, here, if I click on this, will it bring up Twin Motion again? All right, it's bringing it up again. Let's see if by any chance this works. And uh, here we are at the two hour mark, so we will need to finish up, but might as well just see if I can, we'll just give us a new project instead of trying to work with the old one. I don't think I'd saved it. Um, it is now bringing this in. We have a similar view. Um, how do I move around? I guess I can back up here. All right, yeah, we can see um, that this upper roof here, isn't that interesting? It's got some transparent thing. So it's like the, the surface texture of the roof is inverted. It's underneath it. Um, so if I click on the roof and this does this, how can I make it, um, you know, if I right click on it, no, that just deselects it. Um, so I don't know what, what these icons mean. <laughs> um, let's just click on them one at a time. Uh, that's import. This is context paths. That's the vegetation here. Let me select it again. Um, image, panorama, video, BIM motion. Um, start export here. Uh, oh, actually, there are some things up here, right? Um, here. So the shingle, roofing, gray. Um, so what do we need to do here? Break instance, isolate. Say isolate it. There we go. That's interesting. Um, so I've now at least got some, some controls and we can unisolate it, uh, here. So, um, let's see if Francois says, um okay so john chando says does twin motion work in arcade 22 yes it does <clears throat> um at least uh they introduced some connection there in the last few months i was using it you know in in august and so it's definitely possible uh francois says use the dropper in twin motion to pick up the surface um and then go to the settings item on the surface and turn on double-sided Dropper is in the middle of the screen below the 3D. Okay, here's here's the. Um, I close close this up. 
Um, how do I get rid of that? Close that up, right? Use the dropper. Got that dropper here. All right, here are materials. Okay, good. Um, then go to the settings items on the surface. Uh, so shingle roofing gray. Um, material single multi. Um, replace material. So give, I'm getting closer. Um, holding the shift key while moving the mouse. Is, materials are upper left. Layers are at right. Okay, just read my notes above. So I've done the eyedropper settings item on the surface. Where do I do the settings? Is it is it like here? Now that's an overall one here. So shingle roofing, breadcrumb. Click on this. Uh, so this is a choice here. Um, I'm not sure where the settings are. Let's replace it. Uh, we don't want the color picker. Um, so this is something here. Um, so scale settings. Here's settings. Two-sided. Off. Turn it on. Um, okay. So I've just done two-sided there. And now uh, I say check that. Um, how do I get out of this? So I turn off the eyedropper. Um, go back to moving. Um, well, I saw something about two-sided, but it didn't change this issue that we're seeing through through this. So, um, all right. Uh, Jay says two-sided did not work for me either. Okay, so um, need some more investigation and. Uh, you can see that I'm I'm a, absolutely not a magician when it comes to new technology, but I do work hard to understand it as best I can. All right, thank you all for joining me today. <clears throat> um, I didn't check how many were on at the peak, but we've got 85 people on right now. So thank you all. And for those of you who are watching on the recording, uh, I'm glad that you stuck it out to the end. Uh, so I have these ARCAD user webinars once a month. Um, we'll be posting the, um, or I will be posting the recording um, on the Arcade User website, and I'll usually have it on the, my YouTube channel for a while. Um, if you are interested in more information about any of my training products or master template, you can contact me by emailing support at bobro.com. Um, it's my pleasure to help you and Arcade users around the world have more success with Archicad. It's been Eric Bobro. Thanks for watching.